Hello and welcome to Reaching for the Moon, presented by Everglades Moon Local Council, Florida Chapter of Covenant of the Goddess. COG supports individual works by its covens, members, and local councils. It's a vibrant network of a myriad of Wiccan and witchy resources, religious support, friendships, service opportunities, and more. To find out more, visit our website, emlc.net, our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash Everglades Moon, or Twitter, at EMLC Tweets. Hello everyone, this is Lady Bridget, and welcome to episode 27. This is a bonus episode, not connected with any Sabbath. The reason that I wanted to bring you a bonus episode is because there were so many great workshops at Turning the Tides last year, and not everybody got to attend all of them. One of them that we're bringing to you today was given by Raina, and it's about how plants inform us about our ancestors and the relationship between our ancestors and plants. It was fascinating. I do apologize for some of the background noise. Obviously, we're we're outdoors. You might hear a little bit of trains. You might hear the occasional airplane. There also is a meditation uh, towards the end of the workshop. If you're driving, I would strongly suggest you fast forward through that part because you you don't want to get sucked into a meditation, a meditative state while you're driving. It's uh, easy enough to do that and get mesmerized under normal circumstances. Um, But anyways, I just wanted to give you that heads up. It is a really fascinating and interesting workshop that, like I said, was given at Turning the Tides last year. And I will have more information about Turning the Tides at the end of the workshop. So enjoy. My name is Raina, in case I don't know you. I'm very happy to be here and teaching you this or sharing with you some of these ideas. Um, I have been doing ancestral work for a really long time, maybe 30 years, I think. So I am going to kind of skip over some of the basics. And a lot of those have been covered already. And if you have other questions about anything I've said, you haven't stopped me in the middle here to, to ask me or if there's some other aspect of ancestral work you want to talk about, please feel free to, to find me later today. Um, this is a cool workshop for me because it incorporates my mundane job with, as an archaeologist with my magical life. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about some material that I would actually use in my classes and what I think are the more spiritual aspects of some of those kinds of things. This workshop is also very much informed by my uh, training with Orion Foxwood in fairy seership, and um, I know we've been going on and on about fairy seership, but it has been very profound for me in the sense of, uh, in many ways, but two particular ways I'm going to mention right now. One is that ancestral practice is at the foundation of uh, fairy seership, so all of my different little scattered ancestral practices that I had prior to starting fairy seership training have kind of been able to coalesce into something more focused. And then a second point is this very, very strong emphasis on reclaiming the co-creative partnership with the natural world. And that means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. But to me, it has meant most recently about trying to work more with plants and understanding plants as, as not only equal partners on this journey around the sun, but as teachers. And so Luckily, I was raised with people who were gardeners, and and I always felt like that was a very magical thing that they could do, and other people would say that too about them, oh, we're going to get your dad to fix that orchid because he's got the touch, you know. So to me, I have always had a lot of respect for working with plants and being able, anybody who can make plants grow. But we all can do that. It's a, a skill all of us have, especially once we start thinking about ancestral practices. Some of us naturally come to it and some of us have to work at a little bit more. I personally have to work at a little bit more. (laughs) I have killed many, many plants, but I am starting to become better able to listen to them, which is improving the outcome. So this workshop then comes out of some of that experience as well. And my fairy contact, which is a whole side, a whole nother workshop (laughs) 
as uh, Lady B was saying this morning, but Pharisaeship allows us to hear the very partners that we have in this earth. And um, my very contact has been very, very helpful with this. So what we're going to do in this workshop, guess what the theme of this workshop is? Ancestors! <laughs> you never guess that, right? Ancestors, but we are going to be doing um, deep time ancestors, okay? So I'm going to push us back a few thousand years, um, a many thousand years, because I'm interested in all things ancient and old, and I think that this is a key little piece of, of history that will be interesting to you too, and hopefully meaningful. So we're going to deep, we're going to reach past our own conscious ancestors and past even our ethnic ancestry maybe um, to talk about the people who were the first gardeners and um, and then the first farmers and uh, their relationship with the plants that they domesticated or that domesticated them as I like to think about it and then what that says about their connection to certain kinds of plants and how we can tap into that information ourselves as we explore our own ancestry and our own connections with the land. I have a feeling that very basic daily things that we do, the little daily rituals, like the foods we like and the things that we have uh, frequently are some of the most powerful places to exert change. And so if we can just, if we just open our mind up to thinking about little daily practices in different ways, we can make very profound changes with relative grace and almost no cost <laughs> or and no new stuff you need to buy no okay so first let me just take a moment to um, ask our ancestors to join us especially our first gardeners so if you guys will just settle you all look very very settled and relaxed but settle your feet on the on the earth straighten your spine take a few deep breaths I'm gonna do a little invocation Our blood calls out. We call across the bridge of time. We call to those who walked this very same earth so many years ago. We trace back through our river of blood, back through the rivers of the world, back through the different races and nations and loves lost and loves found. To those ancestors, those sacred and beloved dead, who spoke with the plants, who knew they were owned by nature, and who made the contract to feed the world. Be with us Enjoy with us this beautiful day, this loving community, and this sacred food. Hail and welcome. Yeah. All right, so the first gardeners. One of the things that um, I do teach is a little bit about the evolution of human cultures. And probably you guys know this, but I'm just going to go over it very briefly. So probably you know that Homo sapiens, sapien, Nikki, us, have been around for about 40,000 years. And we basically have, we have exactly the same body as those people who were around 40,000 years ago. We have the same size brain. We have the same way of moving. We have the same way of reproducing. Uh, we did have earlier hominid ancestors who are a little bit different than us, like the Neanderthalus. Um, but the Homo sapiens sapien has been around for about 40,000 years. And when we evolved, when we became who we are, the species that we are now, this hardware, essentially, that we have, the brain, the bipedalism, the right-sized pelvis to birth, big fat-headed babies, we were um, nomadic people. And we traveled the world with animals and with the cycles of the plants. And we ate wild food exclusively, right? So we, we know what that lifestyle is like because there's still some people in the world today who eat wild food and live exclusively on wild food. And it's a, it's a great lifestyle, basically. As long as you have enough room 
to move, you only really have to work about two or three days a week to make enough food to, to feed yourselves. And you have a lot of time for singing and art and hanging out, and having love affairs and playing with your children. It's, it's pretty sweet. So that's called the gathering and li hunting lifestyle. We should call it hunting and gathering, but we know the hunting part only accounts for about 10, 15% of the diet. So now we call it gathering and hunting, meaning you're out gathering wild food and you're hunting wild game and uh, you're sharing it in a group, maybe about this size. And um, you, you know, have a lot of downtime. And again, as long as you know where to look for the food, which is the key, and that you have enough space to do it, then you never overextend the natural resources. You harvest all but the last apple. You harvest all but the last grain so that there's enough to rejuvenate. And then you move on to another place. So you have to be pretty mobile. You don't have a lot of stuff. But this is, this is what our bodies evolved to do. Somewhere many thousands of years after that, probably 20,000 years after that, 25,000 years after that, we've been doing this for, in other words, for a very, very long time. It was very, very successful. It was healthy. The planet was able to support us in this way. We started experimenting a little bit more with plants. Well, actually, first we started experimenting with animals, but I'm not going to talk about animal domestication today because that's a whole other workshop. But um, probably pack animals like wolves started hanging around humans and eating our garbage and then they became kind of fond of us and we became kind of fond of them and thus the dog was born but that is another workshop basically we we started uh probably we are well first of all we already knew a tr tremendous amount about plants in order to be a gatherer and a hunter you have to know when the plants will come in season where the best ones are how to harvest just enough but not too much where the next harvest is going to be, etc. So those people who live that kind of lifestyle have a super, super intense knowledge base about the environment that they live in because everything, everything literally is riding on their ability to understand what's available to them. So undoubtedly during the course of that, people, humans like us, started noticing that certain plants grew better in certain places and certain, uh, like maybe by a riverbed, grasses were bigger and, and the berries were sweeter um, or maybe by a trash heap and they sort of cataloged that information put it in the round file and, and used it when they needed to but something really magical happens at 8000 BC and this is a huge mystery in archaeology that we still have not explained it is not due to the way the environment was at the time it's not due to any kind of observable external phenomena but it, around 8000 BC all over the world and all these different places people started actually tinkering with the plants so much that they changed the nature of the plant. Right? So this is what is uh, what we call domestication. Domestication actually physically changes the morphological structure of a plant. So a wild blueberry and a domesticated blueberry are very, very different. They're different genetically, they're different down to their DNA. They will have different properties. So a wild blueberry is going to taste different than a domesticated blueberry, but a domesticated blueberry is going to be fatter and probably produce more and all the different things that humans have done to tinker with the wild plant. Anyway, 8000 BC, everywhere in the world, people are deciding to get real involved with the plants, not just harvesting what they need and allowing there to be enough to replenish itself, but actually really like selecting the fattest seeds, saving those, then planting those somewhere, or maybe fertilizing the ones that were naturally wildly propagated and then saving those fattest seeds and doing that again and maybe putting them, planting them in a particularly good place or carrying them with them, all these things. It takes only about a thousand years, which again, I know that sounds like a lot, but for in this course of the 40,000 years we've been around, it's not very much time to completely change a plant from its wild form to its domesticated form, which by its nature means it's dependent upon humans. So this is the mystery of domestication. In the Middle East, the very first is where we humans were first playing around with plants and we domesticated wheat, millet, rye. And then in Asia, around the same time, again, 8,000 BC, people domesticated rice. And in the New World, they domesticated corn, beans, and squash, the Holy Trinity. Again, 8,000 BC, as far as we can tell. Now, there might have, and this doesn't mean people weren't eating these plants before, but they were eating the wild versions of them. And, uh, and you know 
any of you guys who gather wild foods, it's they're they're usually smaller varieties. The plants produce less. They may be more flavorful, but they're a little bit less predictable, right? So the way we can tell this in archaeology is that the wild versions and the domesticated versions actually look very different. They have different pollen. They have different actual physical structures. So you can see when you're looking at plant evidence um, whether it was wild or domesticated or somewhere in between. So this is one of those mysteries. And I've thought about it. You know, I've taught this for 20 years, and, and, and it, everybody always asks, well, is it because the Ice Age ended? And then it, what, I mean, that was part of it, but the Ice Age had been over for... 4,000 years, so it wasn't the, the jump start that this was something that humans did, and, and by our nature, we are problem solvers. Every big technology that we invent, and domestication is one very big one because it led to agriculture, is a, is a solution to a problem that we face. Metallurgy, the invention of metallurgy, that's problem solving. The invention of, of architecture, problem solving. So, Domestication is one of those, and I've been thinking, talking, you know, teaching this and thinking about it, and as I have started to work with plants more, and I realized the discipline it takes to tend plants well, you know, the, the watering daily, the fertilizing on a schedule, the understanding the soils and the effect of the soils on the plant, the when to harvest, the ripening start, so there's a lot of information. It felt to me as if the plants were domesticating me. The plants are training me. And I asked them, please help me learn how to do this better. And it just dawned on me that the academic story about this is very much human-centric. It's very much about humans decided to do this, and so they did this to the plants. We decided to domesticate wheat so we could have more wheat, and we did. But honestly, I believe very much this is an example of one of those contracts that humans and plants have where we each decided that this was a mutually beneficial relationship for some reason or another. And this is one of the things that Pharisaeship teaches is that at the beginning of time, humans were allowed to be on the earth because we made an agreement to work in partnership with the earth. To act as, as Coyote says, as mediators of the starlight energy that we bring, this problem solving, creative, um, emotional kind of approach to the world with uh, the underworld life force that the natural world um, manifests constantly. And so humans and trees and some stones bridge those two, bridge all of that stuff, this underworld, dreamy life force with the starlight. And then we exist and share it on this world here. And so when humans were allowed to be here, we, we did so because we said we would work with plants to make all that work, make that happen. We would be um, partners with the natural world in that process. We would explore it and push it and develop it and evolve it. And to a large degree, we have. And I think this, I think domestication is one example of that. But I think we also uh, have forgotten, as humans do, the original contract. And we have become more and more isolated from the natural world and more and more um, convinced that the natural world serves us as a resource that we can exploit essentially in the ways that we want. Now I think everybody in the circle probably understands how dangerous that is as um, in terms of our long-term viability on this planet and I agree with uh, Lord Orion that the humans will go before the planet goes but more importantly it just would be it's healing for our own spirits to acknowledge this contract, and it's certainly healing for the earth for us to acknowledge this contract. So I'm going to explain why I think domestication is one of these examples, because what happened was humans have been doing their thing, happily gathering and hunting, living off of wild food, observing plants, observing animals, observing the stars, gathering tons of information and knowledge, but at some point... I believe the plants reached out and said, this could be, we can move this relationship to a deeper level. <laughs> we could really, we could take this farther. And so, because humans are the ones that had to be trained, since the plants have already been doing their thing. Humans are the ones that had to be trained to know what plants to select and then how to plant and how what that would do and how to change their diet, to eat domesticated foods primarily. It's a very big change once we became farmers. So everywhere in the world, we went from this diet that was about 15% protein, 
85% vegetables, wild vegetables and fruits, to almost 75-80% cereals with a tiny bit of protein, meant many fewer vegetables. So that meant tons of carbohydrates in our systems. It's when we started to put on body fat, which we never did before. We started to have cavities, which we never did before. We settled into permanent villages so that we could guard our crops that we put so much time into. And then we became crowded and we had all the, a, a whole bunch of new diseases. The whole idea of settling down and being a farmer is not a rational one really from a human evolution perspective. So, But at the beginning, when the contract was made, I think the plants convinced us that this was going to be a good thing. They were like, okay, you like us, we like you, we can work together better if you pay more attention. Pay a little bit more attention to us and how we grow. Think about it. Why don't you do this instead of that? And then the humans were like, okay. okay. And so the humans tried it and they gathered certain kind of green and um, kind of helped it along. You know, the, like corn, I was this example because of where I work in Mexico. Corn started off as grass. Corn cobs were this big. They were less than a centimeter long. It was a grass. And somehow we have now these ears of corn that are this big, right? Even before we started genetically modifying corn in the United States in the last century, the evolved domesticated version was already like this big, six or seven inches long. So we went from a tiny grass seed to a pretty big corn cob, and again, in about a thousand years, which is pretty amazing, it's pretty phenomenal, a completely different plant. The, new, the domesticated corn completely dependent on humans, humans completely dependent on, on domesticated corn in that area of the world. So this is a contract that I think teaches us something. It teaches us that our ancestors in different parts of the world made this very profound commitment to a certain kind of plant. Like I said, different plants were domesticated in different places. And we don't know the entire story everywhere, but we know um, quite a bit of the, the big ones, the important ones. And they put all their eggs in that basket, those humans. Um, when they decided to domesticate wheat in the Middle East, that was pretty much all people grew. They still had a little garden so they could have supplemented a little bit and they might have been able to trade with somebody if the wheat produced enough extra to trade. But basically they were just gonna bank it all and put all their chips on that crop for that first thousand years. Pretty risky idea, pretty crazy idea. But it worked, I think because they were listening to the plants, they figured it out, they knew how to, to expand the yield, expand the growing season, etc., etc., And um, that commitment could teach us something about our ancestors. So this is where we're getting back to the original ancestors. I wanted to talk about, I took three examples of foods that were really important domesticates in different parts of the world that we could talk about and kind of explore, and that's why we have food here, so we can really explore it. A lot of us have Northern European ancestry or European ancestry. So the first thing I chose was a cabbage. I thought apples were domesticate of Europe because you think you think of apples so much with Celtic mythology. I was going to make something delicious with apples, but apples are actually domesticated in Asia. So they came over to Europe with uh, Marco Polo and all of that trade. Pears, however, seem to have been domesticated in Europe. So if you're looking for a really ancient uh, fruit, your European recipes or ancestors than pears are one of the ways to go. But cabbage, cabbage much more important. Cabbage is important in my Eastern European ancestry. It's really important obviously in Celtic world. It's really important in the Mediterranean. And actually the first evidence we have of it is from uh, classical Greece and Rome where the cabbage was a very important food. It had med medicinal properties as well as it was really important culinary resource. And that was about 1,000 B.C., you know, 800 B.C. for the early Greeks. But it's clearly already domesticated at that point. And we don't really know exactly when the cabbage was fully domesticated, when it went from a wild variety, because there are lots of wild cabbages, to the domesticated, but clearly well before 1,000 B.C. So everybody in Europe was eating a lot of cabbage and has been eating a lot of cabbage for a very long time. And as we know now, it's a super helpful food that we should all be eating more of, right? Uh, than we do, but especially the fermented varieties, which is one of the, another whole workshop on the magic of fermentation, right? That's another crazy idea that humans had that 
clearly the plants suggested it because why would a human really come up with that idea? But it was a co-creative idea, mutually beneficial. Okay, so I chose cabbage as our representative of the old world. The old world, actually, Europe, Europe was is a cultural backwater. Even though I know this is not easy to hear, but they did not innovate very much. They didn't domesticate almost any grain because that all of that was coming from the Middle East. They didn't invent metalworking because that came from the Middle East. They didn't invent cities or really a lot of anything. <laughs> they weren't the first to get to anywhere. We'll say that they basically were just doing their thing, and and they were. They were close by. They had interesting neighbors. So they had everybody in the Middle East who lived in a really challenging environment where they had to squeeze enough food out of the desert in order to feed themselves. Or they were close to Egypt where everything was going on. Or um, the, the Mediterranean where they could, on all these ideas floated around the Mediterranean. But we're going to love the cabbage because not only is the cabbage nutritious, easy to grow, plentiful, it's been around forever in Europe, sort of unites all European cultures as an important food stuff. And then I chose the yam for Africa because a lot of us have, if not African ancestry, I mean all the Cubans here have African ancestry, but if not African ancestry, then we're respectful of our an African ancestry and, you know, we're all African even if you go far enough back. But Africa is where the yam was domesticated, uh, not the sweet potato, which is from South America, but the yam which is truly a separate plant from the sweet potato. So we today use the word yam for the whole, for both of them. We just confuse them all. Um, but they're truly very different plants. Um, and there are a million different kinds of yams and potatoes. But the yam yam is something that's been uh, around forever and super, super interesting. Again, we don't know exactly when it was domesticated, but... We have evidence that people, as far back as Neanderthal, like 100,000 years ago, people were eating wild yams. Yams are um, have clearly been part of the diet for a super, super long time. Tubers, in fact, are probably one of the very first things that humans started to pay attention to and, and help to grow. Unfortunately, they don't preserve as well in the archaeological record as seeds, so that's one reason we don't know as much about them. But um, yams have this intensely deep history with humans if you think about it now that a lot of that is us eating the wild forms but somewhere around probably 5000 bc 6000 bc we started tinkering with yams and domesticating them and figuring out how to grow bigger yams more yams and then i chose the pecan for our, um, the new world because the pecan is one of the uh, foods that was eaten right here in this part of the new world so could have gone with the corned beans and squash thing um, and then we would have corn chips and bean dip, which would have been yummy, but uh, I thought I'd go with North American native foods, which are different, very different than, than Mesoamerica. Um, the pecan is an amazing, amazing nut, and it has only recently been domesticated, so probably only in like the last 150 years. Native Americans have been eating pecans for a very long time, but Europeans are the ones, when they got here, who started saying, hey, we could make the nut bigger and we could make it sweeter and we could grow more of them and they would go bigger and this and that, you know, that kind of thing that we do. Um, and so they're just under domesticated. They're just in the process of being domesticated now, right? And, of course, what we're trying to do is make the nut bigger. And, and they are than they were used to, they used to be. What's super interesting, though, also is that pecans, like, I mean, most of these foods, but pecans are, are, are a hickory. And those hickories have been around for 40 million years. So if you think about this from the plant's perspective, right? So I'm a hickory tree, and I've been around for 40 million years. And at the very, you know, 40 million years in, these humans show up and start saying, let's do this different. <laughs> I have a better idea. And you're like, what? Fine. Out. it's all good it's been working for me for 40 million years no but let's do this different so that's just i think kind of where humans fit into the whole thing we are we are the monkey and the wrench a lot of the time um, tinkering and we're trying to problem solve but a lot of times we're mucking things up but orion teaches us that this is a valued quality even though it has caused us trouble and perhaps has gotten us to this place of this brink of of environmental apocalypse that we're at right now. This constant curiosity and constant desire to mess with things um, is super, super human and probably why we're here on the planet. 
Um, a, an interesting detail about the pecan also is that evolutionary psychologists think that nuts have helped humans evolve once we started eating nuts. And uh, why do you think that is? Mm, yeah, but it's it's different than that. And we didn't know that for a while. Think about what you have to do to eat a nut. Yeah. Yeah, it's a problem solved thing. It's not just obvious that like a, a raspberry. Oh, that looks pretty. I'm gonna eat that. Um, and you don't you see animals eating nuts, so that helps, of course. That's where we learn most of these tricks. But uh, getting them, you know, you, what you see animals doing sometimes is destroying the nut in order to eat it because they don't care. They have a beak. They can pick out the little bits of of meat from all the shell. But if you destroy it by crushing it between two rocks, it's not very useful to the human. So the human took started there and then figured out how to just crack it gently to get those beautiful whole meats out. So nuts are probably a big part of our human evolution. So what I would like you to reflect on is that wherever your ancestors lived in the world, they made a decision at some point to invest in a certain kind of plant. Maybe in just like a small grouping of plants, like the corn beans and squash. And then those plants likewise made a commitment to your ancestors and said, we're going to give this a try. We think these people are interesting and worthwhile. We'll see what happens. And again, plants don't mind dying, so if it didn't work, it, they weren't really out of much, right? Because plants have a different understanding of the living and dying. But I think it was worth it to them. I think they got something out of it. I think that was a protection for them, that they strengthened by being domesticated in some cases. Um, and they were just as the plant world is, interested in humans and what humans bring to relationships. So say my Northern European ancestors, we'll take them, um, how at some point in time they decided to try tinkering with cabbages and um, all of a sudden they had so much cabbage, they ate cabbage every day, uh, maybe a couple times a day, <laughs> they still do in Eastern Europe. And uh, and then, you know, they died. when they died after a long life of eating cabbage, they were buried in the ground. And that soil then nourished more cabbages. And that cabbage grew, and the families ate a lot of cabbage, and people grew fat on cabbage, and then they died, and they were buried in the ground, and that helped more cabbage to grow. If you start thinking about how long that happened, right, I know all of us are relatively recent arrivals here in, in this particular part of the New World. Most of our ancestors lived in the same place for thousands and thousands of years, and they did this with these same plants for thousands and thousands of years. They didn't go out for sushi every once in a while. They had cabbage every day, all the time. So this is this opens up a very long-term relationship, right, of thousands of years of humans and a particular species of plants exchanging energy. The plants are, are feeding the humans, and then the bodies of the humans are feeding the plants, and not only is the physical nutrient exchange happening, but there's an energetic exchange happening, and there's time and effort energy exchanges happening. And so those plants have a deep knowledge of our ancestors. Certain key plants, the plants our ancestors ate, are actually a source of information about our ancestors because they're made of the bones of our ancestors energetically. So if you want to tune in more to your ancestors, especially people who didn't just immediately arrive here, but going back a little bit in time, I think ancestral food is a really powerful way to do it because those plants, they knew the ancestors very, very well. They had a long time to establish a relationship and they cared because I don't think the plants would have gone through this process if they weren't invested in it to some degree. There are many different efforts of domestication that failed. Plants that just were like, forget it, I'm not interested in humans. But mostly it worked, and I think that that's, you know, can be very revealing to us. Yeah. So. Yes. It's very problematic to me, cremation, for yeah. lots of reasons. As an archaeologist, I think we should have more bodies in the ground. But I do also acknowledge that energetically it's very similar. I mean, if you scatter ashes over the land where you lived, energy-wise, your energy is going into the land. It's not only, you're losing physical nutrients. Yeah, if you if you talk to an if you talk to an ecologist, they would say put the body in the ground. Unfortunately, our laws don't actually allow for that right now because our bodies can only go in the ground when they're full of poison. 
um, you know, with formaldehyde vaults, inside cement vaults, right? So unless you're going to a green cemetery, which thankfully there are more and more of those, or you're being buried at sea where you're feeding fish, um, you're not, we've interrupted that process. And how, how, where are there oak trees? Everywhere. And how many different kinds of oak trees? A million. So, and they're beautiful and we like them. They're aesthetically pleasing. They're, we hang out with them. Obviously they have friendly energy. And the acorns are very plentiful and people ate them, but that's a perfect example. They're, they're tricky to eat. Yeah, they don't taste great and they have poison in them. <laughs> but if we domesticated them, we probably would have solved those problems. We would have fattened them up and also made them lose that toxicity. All right, so here's what I thought we would do with our last, is I would like to lead you on a meditation to try and talk to these plants a little bit. Oh, I forgot one very key point. How did that contract happen? Uh, lots of different possibilities, but I think we have, um, those people who work closely with plant energies have accumulated a large body of information about a class of spirits called devas, plant devas. How many people here know about plant devas already? Or divas or devas? Not a diva, but a deva. Okay, I'll make you. All right, um, very briefly, there are some folks uh, independently in different places in the world who have um, decided to, to work very closely with plants. They're growing things, tropical plants, in you know subarctic temperature environments or um, in land that is supposedly you know too polluted to grow anything, um, and they're having great... Because they're working with the, the overarching intelligence of that plant species, okay? So plant divas are not an individual plant. Like this oak tree has spirits which reside with it, but all oaks share an overarching intelligence as well. And so um, if you can get friendly with that spirit, that spirit is full of information, as you can imagine, about how the plant works and what will make it work best. And so tuning into those plant divas is something that people in Fincorn have done. Michelle Small Wright has written books about this in Perlandia and Virginia. I can give you some references if you're interested in reading it. It's truly, it sounds amazing to us because we are not in the habit of working so closely with plants. But all the people are doing it are sort of like super, super easy and mundane. It's just about listening um, and following directions and turning off the chatter and rational brain. Um, and just doing what the plants are saying to do. So I'm thinking the plant devas said, made the contracts and said, the oak plant deva was like, not now. Now is not the time. But the weed plant deva was like, yeah, we're grass. We're, we're used to humans. We can spread and grow bigger. Sure. So plant, these are overarching devas are super interesting um, spirits to contact because they're plugged into the species across space and time. So you, you know, when you, if you did that breathing with uh, the trees workshop with me in the past, you touch one tree, you're touching all those trees, right? That's what the overarching deva does. And it might be a bit much to, uh, of a concept to go talk to them, but it's not actually. Don't, don't, I shouldn't even said that. Don't even think about this being too crazy of an idea. We're just going to talk to these plant devas. And then um, see what happens and come back. And then the final thing is I really want us to, to share some of this food from uh, our different ancestral areas, especially because we invited those ancestors in and they can share it with us. So get comfortable. Close your eyes. Take a couple of deep breaths. Feel yourself comfortably seated on the earth. Feel the warm sun on your skin. Feel a fresh breeze on your face. Allow yourself to feel comfortable, relaxed, connected with this beautiful place. Now in your mind's eye, I want you to open your eyes and see yourself in a field. 
it look very different than anything you've seen before? It could be a familiar place. Sunny, open. You notice on the ground some rabbits. Rabbits are sort of playing with each other. On the earth next to you, there's a frog. It's very quietly sitting there, just sharing space with you. None of these creatures seem surprised by your presence or startled. One of these creatures is going to approach you and beckon to you to follow it. And you're very curious about what this creature might have to show you. So you get up and easily follow it towards the woods. Crossing the field, approaching some trees. As you get closer to the forest, your guide, your animal guide, slows down and you notice that there are some burrows in the ground, some openings, some holes. And your animal guide pops right into one of them and asks you to follow. Go on in to the burrow. It's dry, warm. You fit easily. move through the earth easily as if this was something you did all the time. You come to a little bit o bigger opening, a little bigger burrow, and as you pause for a moment, you notice around you are a lot of roots, a lot of plant roots. You're going to just Listen to those roots for a minute and find one that calls you. When you feel like you've found the right one, I'd like you to try and touch those roots in whatever way feels comfortable to you and ask this plant for its name. share with you if it wishes what kind of a plant it is and whether you should eat it or not. Please don't eat it right now. But also, feel free to ask this plant, if it feels familiar to you, ask it if it knew your ancestors, if it knew your people. Did this ant ever care for your blood? And if so, how? You know that this information is coming to you, whether you consciously remember it or not whether you consciously understand it or not. You're in the presence of the web of connections. And you are learning and healing See what else the plant has to tell you before we leave the burrow.
when you are ready, release the roots and they will release you. Back your way out of the tunnel, the burrow, and back up onto the forest floor. Leave the forest, heading towards the field, heading towards the sun and the breeze. And you bring with you this connection to a plant. ready, return to this place, open your eyes, so what I thought would be nice is if um, anybody wants to try any ancestral food, um, we could do that and then maybe share anything that you might have, offer uh, your thoughts on this topic, I'm sure many of you have other things to share. So this is a, this is pecans and blueberries in a cake, which I know that's not totally uh, accurate, but this is kolkanen, which is, I went light on the potatoes because also potatoes are not totally accurate, but they are the way it's made today. This has milk, so this is vegetarian but not vegan. This is um, yams and black eyed peas. This one is vegan. So feel free. It's called Cole Cannon. C O L C A N N O N. Cole is where coleslaw comes from. It's yes. So let's um before we break up completely, let's focus again. Does anybody have anything they want to share with the group as a whole? Okay, anything anyone wants to share about the meditation before we we break? Are we good? Uh, you, you can have recipes. <laughs> really? Do you have recipes? Yeah, I have all those recipes. Blueberries uh, also are a native, a new world, North American um, domesticate. And they grew wild all the way into Florida. That's why I chose the blueberries. You were saying all oak devas are connected with the same network? Yeah. Like yeah. a like a hive mind? Yeah. Interesting. That's what the so when you start reading the stuff um, from Finthorn, <laughs> they'll they'll talk about the devas that are attached to a particular plant. But this, since they're growing gardens of stuff, you know, rows and rows and rows of cabbage, they soon became aware that there was a single intelligence for all of the cabbage. And there's this great story, Michelle still I'll tell everybody. Hey, let me tell you guys this one last story. Um, this great question that um, Alejandro asked about um, devas and the, uh, what does that mean of overarching intelligence. So Michelle Small Wright has written these books um, about her land in Maryland, and uh, there was this one story that, that really made it clear to me what was going on. So first they started working with the spirits that surrounded an individual plant, but she's growing a large garden, so she's planting rows of cabbage. Let's just stick with cabbage for now. And, um, and and so they, they, in meditation, became aware of the fact that there was a single intelligence, a single spirit for all of that cabbage. That the cabbage, each of the plants of cabbage was just a single meta, sort of a, a, a hair on the head of the spirit of cabbage. And at one point they were having a real problem with slugs eating too much of the vegetables in their garden. And... They tried all the different organic and natural ways to treat the slugs, and it wasn't making any difference. The slugs were still continuing to eat. And Michelle at first was like, she had a little bit of a spiritual crisis because she's like, oh, I thought I was so in tune with everything, and everything was groovy, and we were making so much progress. And then all of a sudden, everything's disrupted. And so she spent time asking the, the deva about this, and the deva was like, well, slugs have to eat too. So why don't you just, if you give us like one row of cabbage for the slugs, then we'll ask the slugs not to eat the other rows of cabbage. He's like, that's a crazy idea, but it totally worked. And so they had a part that was just set that was fine for the bugs and the slugs, and then the other ones were left alone. And that was where it 
it was this overarching energy or intelligence, uh, they call it a very, very clearly the word intelligence, of that species that understood the ecosystem of the species, what it was connected to, what it was related to, what was interdependent upon, um, what it needed as well as what it had to offer. That was a whole other level of information for her about how the plant worked. So yes, I have found in my own um, work in this that say for example, the species of oaks on this land are interconnected in a way that if you touch one, you will receive information from the others. My own ability only extends so far, but I think that this is a way that you could receive information over great distances. If you were tuned in enough to a certain species to understand how it communicated, and that species had, you know, again, hairs on the head of the, of the god um, across, you know, vast areas. We started off learning how to do this through grass, because grass has a whole bunch of examples of separate plants that are all connected under the earth. Some very powerful seers are doing this with fungi. Mycelium are the largest creatures on the earth, and they are profoundly ancient as well as just powerful. So if you can tap into a single mushroom, you basically, you know, have this data network that goes for, you know, some of these fungi are bigger than continental United States. Um, they're, it's almost mind-boggling for us being so small uh, to think about that kind of a network. But I think that has been my experience, is that the species are, are, are interconnected in terms of the information that they share. I do not. I've, I've found that caring for the plants is the offering. And offerings for the fae, yes. But deva, plant devas, no. But I think the mileage could vary on that. So different people would have perhaps different practices. But again, the devas are very, they are not particularly interested in humans. They, they don't have a whole lot of a reason to be necessarily. They are available, but they're not here. They're here. They're charged with really that plant, that plant's life cycle. And they'll interact with humans to the degree to which that advances the life cycle of that plant. Yeah, anything about finned horn. There's a number of different books on finned horn now um, that basically just show you what they've done there. But then um, the, I think probably the most powerful book to read is In Small Things Forgotten. Is that what it is? No, believing if believing as if the God in all things matter, which is Michelle Smallwright. And it's kind of autobiographical and also the setting up of this land uh, reclaiming effort, Paralandia. All right. Well, I think we're a little over time actually, so I know we need to get set up for circle. Thank you, everybody, very much for being here. We'll have more of this food at the feast. It's <laughs> not what we didn't eat here. We'll eat there. Well, I hope you enjoyed that workshop, and I also hope that many of you might want to attend the Turning Tides annual event, which is happening this year, December 9th, 10th, and 11th in 2016. Early bird registration is open until November 20th at $55 for adults and $25 for children, and then after November 20th, the registration jumps up $20, and all registrations must be postmarked by December 2nd in order to attend. You can learn more about Turning the Tides. You can see information about previous years. You can see what incredible workshops are scheduled for this year on our website at emlc.net. And just go to the Turning Tides tab and you will see.